Okay, so please allow me to quickly introduce uh, Ying Tong Shi is an uh, associate professor in the Institute of Philosophy of Mind and Cognition, National uh, Yang Ming Jiao Tong University for the moment right now. And so she is good. Uh, her study uh, is focused on uh, the self consciousness in memory and the imagination, pain and suffering. Uh, and ethical issues, so uh, in human and AI interactions. Thank you, and I also want to thank the our organizing committee for like making this meeting happen. And um, I'm also looking forward to um, the rest of the whole conference. And are you annoyed by this? I'll try to hide this. Okay. So um, the. This talk or this paper is inspired by uh, my two interests or my two favorite topics. One is about um, human experience, consciousness experience, that's why you guys are here. And the other is about um, what I call uh, episode simulation or mental simulation here. That is basically um, like memory, imagination, or sometimes you can kind of like dreaming or my wondering and so i'm interested in like the experience of that and one aspect of it is uh, the immersive um like when we um start imagining something we feel like we are immersed in another world and i feel like while um, most of the researchers who are interested in consciousness have been focusing on like our experience of the immediate world i think um, more could be uh, devoted to this part of the experience that i find uh, fascinating and so um like when we talk about immersion, one of the first things that might come to your mind is extended reality and virtual reality, right? That's what you pay a lot of money to get those like goggles for, to get the immersive experience. And But then also like learning, lots of paper have been talking about how it could facilitate learning or um, gameplay that you don't, you don't want to play you kind of want to play a game in kind of like a different world and what that world could um, offer you, what it's like to be immersed in that world or art, um, literature. And now like here, a lot of like gameplay art, literature, they might like focusing on the narrative, not, not just about like this different world-like environment or um, tourism. They also talk a lot about this, why you have to pay like, plane tickets is like expensive and it's also polluting the world but we still kind of want to travel around and to like see the sites and um, also mental simulation that's just what I'm going to um, mainly talk about even though what I'm going to talk about is not restricted to um, it can also apply to other cases of um, immersive experience but um, the examples I'm going to uh, focus on will be uh, mental simulation and also some would use immersion to describe um, like um, our um, sensory experience of the, the world, the immediate world. So what I'm going to do here is um, first I want to um, kind of um, just um, show you some of the um, main concept or, or main, like how immersion is def defined by some scholars. I'm not going through all of them, but I will show you some. And I'm going to um, show you that immersion is a complex concept. And, um, and I think this um, varieties of immersion can be captured by a multi-dimensional framework. So I'm talking about the concept of immersion. I'm also talking about um, how we can best capture um, immersive experience. And there are different kinds of immersive experience. And then I'm going to argue that there, um, with this different, um, this multi-dimensional framework, and with these dif different dimensions, there can be trade-offs between dimensions of immersion. And I think that kind of shows that, um, like when I'm talking about the varieties of immersive experience, it's not just about like whether it is more immersed or less immersed. It could be like more immersed in this dimension and less immersed in the in the other di dimension. So it's actually more com complex than we thought. Okay. So um, some concepts of uh, immersion. I would just uh, talk about those that have been like cited most. Um, so like Murray. Um, 
immersion is the sensation of being surrounded by a completely other reality and use the water as a metaphor that is as different as water is from um, air that takes over all of our attention, our whole perceptual apparatus. So, so talks about attention and talks about uh, perception. And um, another definition is uh, it's, it's um, not about sensation, but it's a, a psychological state that's characterized by perceiving oneself to be enveloped by include or included in and interacting with an environment that provides a continuous stream of stimuli and experience. And so um, these, these scholars, they propose these um, concept in different contexts. So the, the context is kind of different. So one is focusing on narrative and um, in the context of um, digital media research. And the, other, the second one is more on a virtual environment. And um, Kuhlman and Timmer, Timmermans, for them, it's a feeling of being deeply engaged in a make-believe world as if it is real. So it also highlights um, like this engaged and also like as if it's real. This be a little bit Haitian, last two. And um, has it for, uh, it's uh, the way we follow the general rule or norm that governs imagining. Nemi, namely that imaginers are to imagine the propositions presented as fictionally true to the extent that we follow this rule or norm without acquiring explicit beliefs about the specifics of how to follow it we're more immersed in our imagining so this is not like what is highlighted here is not really about the the war role-like aspect of it but more like the the rules and um, lastly, um, Larson, in the forthcoming um, edited book that's focused on immersion, and um, he tries to generalize like what all different concepts of um, immersion, what it could be. And this is the way that um, he generalizes it, that is whatever its kind, immersion is always a matter of someone relating to a certain context in a certain way. So I'm going to follow Larson's, um, this, this um, this way of characterizing immersion and um, talk about quickly talk about some aspect of it so um, first of all like just kind of like uh, offer a quick um, detailing of um, different aspect of um, the component of the immersion so first um, what what kind of matter is this so it could be a kind of experience or feeling it could be um, a kind of um, psychological or cognitive state or process or it can be a kind of ability and then um, certain contexts what could it be so it could be um, the immersive context could be a role so it's just like a more world-like it could be a real world or more a counterfactual world so if you are like immersed we are thinking about immersed in the computer game, immersed in a, like a um, the novel or story. Then that's a counterfactual world. Or if you are like using VR, you're probably like trying to be immersed in a virtual environment. But then there could be like non-world like. So it can um, sometimes it's also used to um, characterize like one being um, immersed in a set of rules. For example, um, if you're playing card games, um, or even like you can be immersed in a process or an activity. So it's not necessarily like you have to be in, like kind of like transported into a different world, but it could be immersed in some sort of process or activity that doesn't really either have a, don't have a world like um, this, this kind of property, or it doesn't have a, like a specific set of rules. And it could be more, like and um then the last one and this is the one i'm going to focus on is uh, so in what way um i guess that's the most important part of um what um um what constitute immersion and so um here based on um the definitions i propose that there are three different ways of understanding immersion and um, one is um, when we are talking, some, when some people they are talking about immersion, they are actually talking about engagement. So engagement could be sensory engagement, could be some sort of a motor embodied engagement, or uh, more attention, attentional, so focusing on what they're pay attention to, whether um, like they are distracted or not. 
or um, it could be like emotional, like whether um, one one's like overwhelmed by some sort of emotion or not, or a narrative engagement, whether one's like understanding the story, following the story, or trying to like be being part of the like trying to edit even like edit the stories. And so, for example, like in game immersion. Um, they would measure uh, concentration, curiosity, and control, which I think would be um, part of this um, dimension. I have introduced them, the multidimensional part of it. And the second way to understand um, in which way we can be um, like relating to this um, immersive context is a presence. So um, I think this is also um, mentioned a lot, especially in the um, VR. Um, by the VR scholars, um, they um, care a lot about um, self presence, particularly. That is, when you feel like you are in this virtual environment, do you feel like you are in that environment? Like, do you feel like your 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 um, your presence is in that environment? But it, um, in addition to that, there's they some also talk about physical presence. That means like in this virtual environment, whether the object feels like they are real or not, or social presence, whether when you are um, interacting with others in this um, environment, do you feel like those um, agents you are interacting with, whether they, they are real or not? Or even some would, um, here I put endorsement, meaning like um, whether you see something as real. So it's, I think it's another way to present um, presence. There's just a, uh, I thought I already talked about this. And I think what is interesting is that um, in some, um, also in um, game immersion, they um, try to understand cell presence in terms of empathy, because um, they are trying to see whether like this this person actually um, like empathize the um, protagonist in the story. So they kind of like understand it through empathy. So whether it's, um, this subject playing the game think um, he or she is really the avatar in the game. And lastly, it's opacity. That is whether one is being, uh, one is uh, inaccessible or um, unconscious of the original reality or the entities that exist outside of the immersive context. I guess that's, uh, it's, it's easy to understand um, using a VR case. So when you are in a VR environment, you don't want to also like notice what is going on outside of this VR world. You'd also don't want to notice that I'm now like wearing what, like wearing what kind of equipment and there, there is this cable that is um, follow, following me. And so it's like the feeling of being cut off from reality. And here the reality was the original reality. And it includes awareness of their interface. So um, one example, like I think my wondering can be understood, like in some, could sometimes be understood as an example. So when we are, when we might wonder, we will entertain like a spontaneous flow of thought that can become disconnected from the current environment. So, um, I've shown you some definitions of immersion, and I've also like tried to make immersion very um, complicated. And so now, like, what philosophers do when we say like this concept is so so complicated, it's used by this person this way, it's used by the other person that way. So they kind of basically understand um, using this concept in a totally different way and understand it a different way. What do we do like when we have this complex concept? And there are different ways to do that. So one of the first intuitive way maybe for philosophers is to fight each other and to say that I own this concept and this should be understood in this way and like not other ways. But of course, like, we're not like this anymore. And um, so, um, for example, like at one, one I really like is um, to take a, plur a more um, pluralist route, so, like that is some um, to um, actually, for example, um, I, I think it is easier to understand, understand through an example. So, um, for example, um, Anna Alexandrova, she's uh, interested in well being. And, um, but, like all other concepts, well being is understood differently by different scholars. And um, what she proposes is that we should have different understanding of well being in different contexts. So the meaning of well being um, differs from context to context. When you're talking about 
um, child well-being, the meaning of well-being is actually different from um, other well-beings when you're talking about, for example, like an adult well-being. So this is a, another way to do it, like you can do like um, adopt this approach. But here I'm more um, leaning towards um, another way to deal with this, that is uh, um, understand to understand immersion as a polyidic concept. That means that it's a concept that has many different dimensions. And also using a multi-dimensional view to capture immersive experience. That is not a concept, but what is what what is the exper experience that we're trying to capture? And so um and, and the reason for um, to favoring this over um, a more pluralist or contextualist view is that um, I think pluralist, pluralist or contextualist view work pretty well if um, this concept only work like there's only one concept that's useful for a certain context. But I think um, in the context when we are talking about immersion and we were talking about specific kind of in, kind, kind of situation, for example, VR or for example, like what we are I'm going to focusing on would mainly be um, mental simulation, ima imagination, memory. And I think um, different ways of understanding immersion, they can all um, benefit our understanding to um, what is an immersive experience of like when we talk about um, these kind of mental simulations. So I think um, here it's more appropriate to adopt a multi-dimensional view. And the last thing I want to show is that um, with O, with O, if you take a multi-dimensional view, then um, I would just simply put. I, sh I should add another slide to explain this. So I. I should, uh, so if you take a multi-dimensional view, and then what would be the dimensions? And there are different ways to like construct this uh, framework. But here, just um, for simplicity, I would just take the last, um, like last th three things I mentioned, which is engagement, opacity, and um, presence as three dimension. But of course, you can even like um, expand this um, other um, aspect of it to um, expand this framework, but I'm just going to focus on how we are, um, how how a subject relates to the um, this immersive context, and by um, focusing on these three ways, one could be focusing this three dimensions using these three dimensions to grasp how um, one could understand how one is related to the. Um, immersive context so and I, I would then I want to show like there can be a trade-off between the dimensions of immersion so now the idea is that there are this multi-dimensional framework of immersion and one dimension is engagement one dimension is um, opacity one dimension is presence and why do I need this multi-dimension is that if there's no multi-dimension then there will be one just one dimension right and with just one dimension it would be like either more immersed and less immersed so it would be have to Either you choose engagement opacity or presence, or you choose like three will have to be like more when we are, I'm saying something is more immersed. But here, I, I think that multidimensional uh, framework make more sense because there can be a trade-off between these um, dimensions of immersion. And this not only shows that this framework is a better framework, I really need a slide on this, that it's a better framework. It also shows that uh, immersive experience can be very complex. And so the first thing is about engagement and opacity. And um, here I'm just using some very everyday examples. So if you were, I don't know if I've ever had this experience. Um, I just thought it's probably a common experience. So if you um, just randomly walking around your living room and pick up a shell or something else like a memento, and then you're like inter like playing this 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 shell this this thing and um at the same time it, it reminds you it reminds you of uh, the last time you went to the beach and what you've done in the beach and and all the things so it's a it's it's a it's an example to show that you can at the same time you can have um engagement but also losing opacity which means that um when we are talking about being immersed in this um memory um you are supposed, if if there's one dimension, you're supposed to be in this memory and not 
like not uh, either engaging it with other things outside of this um, immersive context, but at the same time you are interacting with um, this um, external object and which actually uh, facilitate your memory. Or um, this is one of the um, common examples in imagination literature that is um, when they're talking about the epistemic uh, um, uses of imagination. So if you go to IKEA and you're trying to you see a, fan, a fancy sofa, you want to see if this sofa fits your living room, and then you will like start um, looking at that sofa, the dimension of it, and like see trying to like have an idea of the size, but also at the same time, you're trying to um, imagine how it will look um, inside, your, inside your living room. So it's also another example of how you can be engaged in the um, imagination, but also not, um, also not just only on the immersive context, but also on something outside of the immersive context. So here I want to show is that there is this trade-off between engagement and opacity. Sometimes you can, it's not like you don't, you're not aware of things outside of the imagination that will allow you to have more in immersive experience. Sometimes it's the opposite. You actually not fully like, sometimes interacting with something outside of the immersive context can facilitate the engagement of the immersive context. And lucid dreaming, I think, is another case, but I, I want to um, skip that. And I, was, I want to talk about another trade-off that I think is um, interesting. So um, it requires me to um, quickly introduce um, this field and observer perspective, which I think is not that difficult to understand. And um, Salty will tell you more about this later. So field perspective and observer perspective, when we were talking about um, memory, it, it, it means that you can remember something from the original perspective that um, you perceived in the past. And if you're um, like using an observer perspective, it means that you're rem remembering the past event from a perspective that's or not originated from where you, 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 you uh, originally experienced it. And it can also happen in like, uh, not just in memory, but also imagination and dreaming. You can have observed perspective on um, dreaming. And so what I want to um, um, invite you to look at is this um, framework that's um, offered by um, Cross and uh, iDuke. And um, I'm not going to nitpick how they name like different perspectives, but they can, you can kind of see how they um, understand immersion here. And they're, they're not focusing on the concept of immersion, so that they're not like the target I want to attack. But um, so how they understand two different perspectives. So they kind of name the, uh, the a uh, field perspective as self-immersed perspective, and the uh, observer perspective as a self-distanced self perspective. And um, they've uh, they review a number of studies on perspective and motion, and they have they have also done several um, themselves, and um, they. Um, concluded that like in participants in the self-distance group focus less on um, recounting the emotional arousing features of their negative experience and more on const uh, construing it in a way that provide them with uh, insight and closure. That is to compare with the self-immersed um, group. And so um, here they have this uh, framework to summarize what they think is happening and can just focus on the second column that is, they think that when you are self-immersed, what they call self-immersed, that is actually like taking a field perspective. Um, they think that um, they are like more recounting and that is like they are more, um, I would call it emotionally um, engaged and not focusing on the narrative. But when they're adopting observer perspective, they are um, less emotionally engaged. Um, and more um, narratively engaged. I actually have some examples of some um, reports of participants, but I, I won't go into that. And so here I want to show that it's, it's I think the, the whole point is to show that immersion is a complex, complex concept. And here, um, instead of saying which one is more immersed, which one is less immersed in the memory, we should say, um, when you are 
when you are adopting a when you are adopting a field perspective, you are more in, you are more Im immersive in terms of the emotional engagement. You are less immersive in terms of the narrative engagement. And when you are adopting a self-distance uh, perspective, you are less Im immersed in the emotional engagement and um, more immersive in terms of the narr narrative engagement. And so what I want kind of want to say is that using this uh, multi-dimensional framework, you can break down what immersion means and actually talk clearer about um, what you are actually looking for in a specific context. And I actually want to talk more about self-presence, uh, but it's just going to be too complicated and I've heard that I won't be able to talk about these. So, conclusion. So, I think I've um, talked about them like it's a, a complex concept and a multi-dimensional framework would, would do to capture engagement presence and opacity. And their trade-off between these dimensions have shown like engagement opacity and um, emotional engagement and narrative engagement and how it's related to presence, uh, assuming that um, when you're adopting field perspective, there's more presence. And I think it can show like the variety of um, immersive experiences. Thank you. Uh, very uh, nice talk, thank you so much. Um, there are some situations uh, such as when uh, athletes and musicians are in the zone and there's some uh, types of uh, meditation or mindfulness when people can almost like dissolve themselves. Would you consider these three examples either together if you think they're one or separately if you think they're separate? Are those examples of immersion the way that you view it or are those something different? So I don't, I think, um, given what I'm going to talk about here, I'm not, I don't think I'm responsible for giving you the answer, but I can offer you a framework for you to look how, like for, for you to, uh, analyze this. So, um, what I would suggest is that you will need to, um, take a look at these three dimensions, engagement, presence, and opacity, and, and see whether, um, how you evaluate, um, based on these, um, dimensions. And I would say, like, this is just for the rest, I don't take responsible for it. But like, if I use this framework, then I would say that you are engaged when you're meditating, you probably are uh, more engaged in or in, in a specific way, even though I'm not quite sure. I think it also depends on what kind of meditation you're, you're, you're doing. And, um, and for opacity, it's probably rather clear that you're Actually not. It also depends on what kind of meditation you're doing, right? Whether you are aware of things outside of uh, this immersive context. And for presence and uh, self-presence, I think it also depends on what kind of meditation you're doing. Because for some, it, it, we will say that yourself kind of dissolves. For some, they probably wouldn't say that. So yeah, I would I would answer your question this way. Thank you. Thanks, Bertolt. Um, so I have a question about the notion of narrative engagement. Um, so if I understand it correct, um, I think you talked about narrative engagement towards the beginning of the talk, um, saying that sometimes you get immersed in uh, a narrative when you're reading a story or something. And towards the end, you talked about narrative engagement uh, when you record a memory and you take an observer perspective. And I was wondering if these two um, are the same thing, if they mean that if you um, referring to the same thing by imagining data here. Yeah. Um, I ask this because um, it seems to me that when you take an observer perspective to your memory, you're not actually immersed. When you focus on the narrative of the, um, the thing that happens to you, um, it seems more detached rather than immersed. Yeah. So um, maybe just, just I would just take this chance to um, offer an example I was um, planning to um, talked about in the talk. So um, in one of the report um, from um, Cross and I took, I took they, it's, um, um, so when this subject was using um, self-immerse or like using um, field perspective, um, 
he or she reported that I was appalled that my boyfriend told me he couldn't connect with me because he thought I was going to hell. I cried and sat on the floor of my dorm hallway and tried to prove to him that my religion was the same as his. And so it was so um, the way the authors um, interpreted is that it's mainly about um, the emotion and like it's more um, like occupy the, the emotion toward the event. And but when I'm taking a more self-distanced uh, view, um, report is that I was able to see the argument more clearly. I initially empathized better. Uh, I initially empathized better with myself, but then I began to understand how my boyfriend um, felt. It may have been irrational, but I don't understand understand his um, motivation and stuff. So here, um, I think what I try to show is that one can be un like to have this narrative engagement it includes to understand um, the narrative better or um, even like to, um, one can also be part of the author of the um, narrative. So there are like a um, number of ways of engaging in terms of narrative engagement. And, um, but I agree with you that one could even go further to make such a distinction between, um, for example, what um, Goldie made about um, whether how one um, engage in a narrative as the from the internal perspective as the uh, one of the characters in the story and how one engage with the narrative from like a author's perspective or a, an external um, viewpoint and yeah I think that could be put into understand that I think that would just kind of I would support even support that to I don't mind to like mess it up like to make it even more complicated okay so our next speaker uh is Yen Ping. Yen Ping. Yen Ping. Uh, he is a phd candidate uh, fully, uh, with the department of philosophy at the Rosman institute of philosophy at Manchester uh, university canada so uh, he's working on the philosophical foundation of virtual so today I'm going to present a presentation called Virtual Verticalism, Cognitive Orientation, and Freakian Representationalism. So uh, my, this is my outline. First, I will lay out what is the debate, what is the virtual verticalism, and my presentation will focus on one famous philosopher's defense, which is David Chalmers. Uh, he just uh, defend propose an argument defending uh, virtual verticalism. And my presentation is going to uh, analyze in detail uh, his argument and to uh, evaluate whether he is successful. Okay, so welcome to Taipei. I believe you are already immersed in everything in this city, my beautiful motherland. So you will see that uh, the sky is blue and the uh, Type 101 is taller than other buildings, right? And this is our visual experience. And intuitively, we think that these visual experiences are vertical or true, right? But imagine that if we are in virtual reality and these things are all virtual, are we are our visual experience are also vertical or not? So there comes a debate in philosophy. So many uh, many philosophers think that no of experience in virtual reality or I, what, which I call VR experience are illusory because we perceive virtual things as having properties that no relevant object has. So like we perceive Taipei 101 as uh, taller than other buildings, right? But actually they are all virtual. It is not really tall. It's not really taller than other buildings. So these are all illusory, right? But the other in, in the other camp, which is called virtual verticalism, they think that many VR experiences are as vertical as ordinary experience. So even though we are in virtual reality, we can perceive something in virtual reality as real, or they are just vertical because we can perceive virtual things as having virtual color, location, or shapes, which they do have. And uh, today, because I'm uh, focusing on this debate, so I just assume that uh, VV is right in this presentation, okay? So here we come to uh, lay out Chalmers' defense of virtual verticalism. And he uh, argues that, okay, he, uh, we, 
we can admit that not all VR experiences are vertical, but some of them can be. So uh, what kind of VR experience can be vertical? They, they, uh, there are some very expert, expert VR users, which uh, he calls a sophisticated VR user. And this VR user has a knowledge that uh, we are in the virtual reality. So we, they, when they uh, take a VR gargle and go into a v virtual reality, they know that what they perceive are virtual. So that um, if they have that, such kind of knowledge, then um, that knowledge orients what they perceive. They will perceive those virtual things as virtual. So if that is the case, uh, sophisticated VR user perceive virtual object as having virtual color, location, and shape. So in that case, virtual vertical isn't true. And as we know, uh, P1 is an empirical fact, right? So uh, I, I think everyone will agree that, okay, sophisticated VR user know that uh, they are in VR. But the critical premise is P2. Uh, if that is the case, why? Uh, the knowledge orients what they perceive, why the knowledge can orient their perceptual experience. And Chalmers gives a, a, an illogical um, support for that. He argues that, okay, uh, we have another case like a driving case in, uh, uh, for, for a sophisticated driver. If they know that the things seen in the rear mirror are located behind the car, then that knowledge orients the content of their experience such that they perceive the thing in the rear mirror as being located, located behind a car, not in front of the car, right? So uh, if that is the case, then we can say that, okay, uh, this kind of uh, phenomenon also occur in a, a VR user case. And um, Thomas coined a term called a cognitive orientation to refer to such kind of phenomenon. So um, P2.2 is an uh, analogical inference. and uh, yeah, we still have a question, why? Why is the case? Why P2.2 is, is true, right? So he gives a more uh, reason for that. He argues that for the uh, occurrence of a cognitive orientation, there are four constraints to be satisfied. So uh, yeah, the first constraint is that, okay, the sophisticated drivers have to know that the real mirror is present, right? If they don't know, then Absolutely, the, the visual experience are not altered, right? And the other one, they are familiar with how mirrors function in the perception. They know how the mirror uh, 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 function, so uh, they can do something in terms of uh, the function of a mirror, right? So the action, the driver's action also depends on that familiarity. And the fourth one, um, the, interpret the interpretation on which the things are located behind is more natural than the interpretation of uh, the, the things are located in the front because there's comparison between things in the mirror and things not in the mirror, right? So we can naturally interpret that those things in the mirror are actually located in the back. So all these features are checked, but in the driver case, and Chalmers go continues to other argue that those four features also are also satisfied in a VR user case. So knowledge, sophisticated VR users know they are in VR. That's by definition, right? And the second one, they are familiar with how VR functions in perception. Yeah, uh, they know that uh, how, uh, if they use some uh, uh, tools to help them to uh, approach the VR things, then what will happen, right? And the third one, their action depends on this familiarity. Those sophisticated users know how to use the, like a controller to, uh, to, 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 to kill the zombie in, in the virtual reality. And the fourth one, yeah, it's an interpretation. Uh, the interpretation on, thing, on which the things are virtual is more natural than the interpretation on which they are physical. So given those four uh, features, Chalmers argued that, okay, VR user case uh, also satisfy these feature and then the analogical inference can be made. So if that inference can be made, then P2.2 is true. That's Chalmers argument, right? But wait. What he said is the county orientation because that notion was uh, coined by uh, Chalmers himself. So we have to have some uh, textual evidence to, to approach that uh, notion. If we interpret that notion in different ways, then uh, there may be different consequences to evaluate P2.2, okay? So according to Chalmers, 
uh, cognitive orientation is a sort of cognitive penetration, which is the case where uh, cognition influences perception. And in this case, background knowledge help orients one to the perceived world, giving global interpretation to what is perceived. So that's pretty good because uh, the key notion, cognitive penetration, is largely investigated in scientific and philosophical uh, 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 community. So we can have some uh, anchor to evaluate what is uh, cognitive orientation. However, in the scientific debate, we have still some ambiguity within the notion of uh, cognitive or penetration. So uh, here I give two different interpretation of what the cognitive penetration is, which is uh, the first one is synchronic, the, the other one is diachronic. For the first one, the synchronic penetration in which uh, perceptual content is synchronically influenced by a current cognitive state. But for a diachronic cognitive, cognitive penetration, there has to be uh, a long-term change in like uh, from perceptual learning or uh, influence from your previous experience or cognitive state. And if we interpret cognitive orientation in terms of uh, different notion of cognitive penetration, there will be a different uh, consequence of uh, Chalmers argument. Okay, so I'm arguing that cognitive or orientation cannot be synchronic, but only diachronic cognitive penetration. Okay, so uh, how do I argue that it cannot be synchronic? Let us consider a very uh, historical case, uh, the famous historical case, which is called Innsbruck goggle experiment, which was uh, conducted in the uh, uh, 1950s, and it is a uh, experiment about uh, perceptual adaptation. So those uh, uh, subjects, absolute participants, were asked to uh, wear a goggle which occupied their completely uh, visual field, and that goggle just reverse all all of what they see uh, in um, upside down or left left side right, something like that. And these uh, subjects were asked to wear the goggle continuously for a couple of days. And in the first four days, three days, four days, those subjects could barely do anything like daily work or something like because of the uh, altered visual perception, right? But starting from the fifth day and sixth day, the participants just what was adapted to the altered perception and started to do something that is really okay. That that is that was really uh, uh, good. As, as if they didn't really uh, wear the goggles. So during the time of uh, adaptation, we can see that this case can satisfy the four constraints, four features that uh, the Chalmers argues for cognitive orientation. But I'm arguing that this case that didn't involve uh, the cognitive, uh, synchronic cognitive uh, penetration. So let's see how the four features were uh, satisfied. First, knowledge. The participant really know that what they see are upside down because the experimenter didn't really uh, uh, conceal the fact. Okay, the familiarity, those participants became familiar with what goggle function to their perception. Yeah, that's right, because uh, uh, during the, uh, the fourth, fifth days and sixth day, the participants be became uh, very familiar with how they could do, right? So the action still depended on how they learned from the uh, perceptual learning. And the fourth one, yeah, it is. It was really uh, natural to interpret it, uh, the upside down altered perception as um, as uh, differently from uh, those who didn't really wear the goggle. Okay, so uh, these four features were uh, all checked, but uh, actually this IGE, the, the experiment didn't really involve the cognitive, uh, synchronic cognitive penetration. Why? Because if it happened, if the synchronic cognitive uh, penetration happened, then uh, the participant would not spend uh, four or five days to adapt the altered perception. Yeah. Okay, so the analogical inference cannot be made because we have uh, the third case that block the analogical inference. Okay, so now the cognitive orientation is only diachronic uh, cognitive penetration. So uh, I think the analogy uh, P2.2 make more sense since we spend time learning to perceive more accurately. So uh, Chalmers argument since sound under this interpretation, but 
uh, there is still a problem because even if P2.2 makes sense, uh, we still have some problem with the uh, uh, conclusion, like uh, layer four, sophisticated VR user perceive virtual objects as having virtual color, location, and shape. Therefore, PVV is true, virtual vertical is true. There is something missing because uh, the arrow doesn't make because uh, county orientation only reveal the etiology of perceptual content without addressing the verticality. So we still don't know by virtue of what are sophisticated VR user perceptual experience vertical uh, rather than illusory. We need a theory of content that uh, attribute what the phenomenal character in the real world. Okay, that's the most philosophical part in my presentation. So, uh, yeah. So for uh, Chalmers' uh, argument to be successful, we have two constraints because the theory of content has to be satisfied uh, by the Chalmers' argument. So uh, there are two constraints that uh, the uh, content theory has to be made in order to fit the argument. The first is same phenomenology because according to uh, Chalmers, we can have the same radius experience in ordinary world and in the virtual world. So uh, in these two words, the phenomenology of the radio experience have to be the same, but the extension have to be different because in a physical world, we have the physical redness, but in the virtual world, they are all virtual, they are all digital. There is no physical redness. So the thing that uh, yields the radio experience has to be uh, the virtual redness, okay? So uh, Chalmers proposed another a uh, theory of content to address the, the problem, which is called uh, the Phrygian representationalism. In short, uh, the Phrygian representationalism argues that the phenomenal character represent the property that normally cause the experience of the uh, character in the subject under certain perceptual conditions. So uh, under this theory of content, uh, we can have the radius experience called phenomenal awareness, which represent uh, either virtual awareness in virtual context or physical awareness in physical context, okay? So uh, I think that that would be uh, really good for uh, the Chalmers to uh, uh, defend his uh, uh, um, argument for the virtual verticalism, okay? Okay, so uh, I think the uh, time is up. So I'm just up here to, uh, for your comments and feedback. Thank you. Can you explain a little bit about the difference between Australian representation of mm -hmm. Dragon um, and how is this to do with uh, the charmers as they didn't get with? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's just clarify this. Yeah, you. okay, no problem. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so. Um, from, from the previous argument, I just argued that we need a theory of content to fit argument, uh, Chalmers' argument, right? And in the philosophical literature of perception, there are many different theories about perception on the table. And some are like a naive, naive realism, some are representationalism. And representationalism is a view that our perceptual experience is just like a kind of belief, uh, similar to belief or some kind of state that has the content to represent the world. And once that has a content to represent the world, uh, we have to fix what the content is. So what the meaning of something in our representational state that can uh, attribute the property in the world. And the difference between Rosalian uh, and Fragian representation is the theory of content about how a certain content attribute the property of the world. For example, for Rosalian representationalism, for any content to represent the world, there has to be uh, like uh, to uh, to have a very simply explanation, there has to be one one correspondence between a certain content to uh, one certain property. But for Fragian representation, they think that no, it's not the case. A, what a certain content can represent different properties in under different conditions. So that's a debate of uh, theory of content. That's a just pure philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just according to argument, uh, sorry, so according to Chalmers, an object is virtually red when it uh, produces radio experience in condition that are normal for virtual reality. So, uh, according to him, we can have the radius experience 
that is just the same of the radio experience we experience in the physical world. So for that uh, context, in the virtual context, we can still have the radio experience, but in that virtual context, we the the uh, reddish phenomenal content cannot represent anything physical, right? So for it to be veridical, they have to be representing some virtual things in the virtual context. Yeah, and the Phrygian representation really can have some resource to uh, solve that issue. Yeah. So the next speaker, uh, he will join us from online. Uh, he's uh, Yu Wei Sun. Uh, so uh, he's a final year PhD student uh, in uh, Tokyo University, and his research uh, is interesting in um, uh, decentralized neural network, uh, meta learning, and AI security. So he will give a, the presentation through online. So let's welcome Yu Wei Sun uh, from online. Thank you for the introduction. So today I want to talk about um, the difference between our current uh, deep neural networks and uh, um, the neural networks that we really want when we consider about uh, uh, recent studies of uh, neuroscience and uh, also consciousness theory. Um, so to just to get started, um, as we know that deep learning is uh, constantly changing the world both in industry and the uh, scientific discovery. And we can see it uh, improves the performance in different modalities, uh, the computer vision, uh, natural language, and also like other uh, scientific fields, like protein folding. Um, so the question is, uh, is the current unit work already have the prob probability to evolve into the next stage? Uh, so there is a very recent paper uh, published, um, uh, put on the archive by the uh, Benjos group. It's titled The Consciousness in Artificial Intelligence. And it says uh, at the end of the abstract, so their conclusion is um, our analysis suggests that no current AI systems are conscious, but also show that there are no obvious barriers to building conscious AI system. So it's uh, it's to me it's both exciting and boring at uh, at all wise. So today I want to discuss uh, what's the current stage of uh, AI research regarding the um, theory of consciousness and uh, how we can build upon that. So first, to understand the systems uh, we aim to build uh, in terms of the information processing, it it was described by uh, Dahane in the science architecture, a uh, science article where the two types of consciousness uh, are C1 and C2. And uh, it says that C1 is about the selection of information, uh, especially for the global broadcasting, making it flexible, available for computation and the report. And in addition to that, we have the C2, which is uh, more about the self-monitoring of these different computations uh, going on in the C1. And uh, our goal is to study the different uh, uh, possible architectures uh, regarding the models that can resemble the C1 functionality. And similarly, we can see the system one and system two hybrid richer uh, especially the system one type of processing is usually intuitive and fast, more like today's uh, deep learning. Uh, we have the input and the model where uh, forward propagates the information and give out a certain prediction to the input. Um, and on the contrast, system two processing is more x based and, uh, and sometimes slow to compute, but it could be very useful one way try to solve problems, uh, especially related to the new situations. Um, and uh, in machine learning, usually there are studies like localized learning and the meta learning. Um, so the question is uh, how we can bridge the gap between the current uh, uh, monolithic neural network research like a convolutional neural network uh, transformers 
and the next generation AI research. So our research groundings are based on the global workspace theory. We try to uh, build an artificial systems that can resemble the functionality um, appeared in the global workspace. So the first condition of the global workspace theory is uh, processing a very large set of specialized systems that can perform different tasks in parallel. And another core condition is uh, we want to have a um, communication bottleneck to control the different flow of this information. So that will result in a guided attention in, uh, with a very limited capacity. And also in the global workspace theory, it claims that uh, the states are conscious once they are globally broadcast to many modules through the global workspace. So we can say when we say having a limited capacity, the workspace can enable the different input modules to have a competition with each other to share information for better efficiency. Uh, so if you heard about the current transformer research, in transformer, they usually talk about the different pairwise interaction among modules. So that appears to me is more like a very dense a uh, connection among modules similar to the global workspace. So there misses a, a sparse bottleneck that can encourage the computation. To build the global workspace, uh, we need a collection of specialized uh, modules which can perform tasks in parallel. And in conventional global learning approaches focus on the comprehending the patterns and relations across Intel datasets. Well, this is effective for capturing the general trends. It's uh, slow and uh, less suitable for the generalization task. In contrast, the lo localized learning, it means we want to target uh, the patterns and pictures within a specific uh, a restricted area of the context for specialized tasks. This can lead to quicker learning of the local patterns. Then we have modules that trended on independent tasks or jointly trended end to end in the model, from which the module can specialize, uh, can get an emerging specialization. So here I show several examples of recent studies uh, bridging the gap between the machine learning and the global workspace and also the modularization of neural networks. Right, so to start with, I want to discuss uh, several toy examples of uh, the problem of generalization we are discussing in the uh, machine learning. So we can see usually the observation uh, from different uh, environments uh, are quite different. So if we say we have a neural network that is trended on this data set. Then when we move the model to uh, slightly different data sets, so the model usually will have a largely decreased uh, accuracy. So the problem is uh, the knowledge cannot be um, very clearly disentangled between the main object and the other um, distracting information in the data. And similarly, when we have different numbers of samples, uh, different number of observations for a certain object, the model will also uh, be confused. So the generalization problem here, it refers to a neural network is uh, difficult to tackle the uh, real world data that has slightly different appearance. And we want to know um, how to incorporate a global workspace to improve the information alignment of among the different modules to reduce the information loss in the knowledge transfer uh, between different modules. So recording the two ways to build the global workspace modules, the first case is uh, we can have a large set of modules that are trended on independent tasks. So that's exactly what we are trying to do here. 
So let's say we have separate models trended on different observations. And the goal here is to say we want to reuse the information already learned by the independent uh, neural networks to solve a different uh, observation. So we can see that this test observation have uh, different uh, features with the training set. Um, then we want them to collaborate through the shared workspace by aligning and reusing the localized knowledge. To align the features from the two different observations, uh, we first uh, want to try a uh, feature disentangler. Uh, since we want to differentiate between the representation that is uh, really uh, meaningful to the task. So in this case, we want to the model to identify if the obtained information is related to the classification task. Say we want to identify this image as one so the most important information from the images are the object area. So we want to align the extracted information between these two observations so we can get a more uh, refined uh, uh, common knowledge between these two observations. So, the, so as we can see, we want to improve the the communication efficiency between these two modules. And another way is uh, we can do an embedding matching. Um, so this is based on statistical method. Uh, it's try to further align the different observation. So I will not go into uh, details. And the, another way is uh, we want to do a module aggregation. Since the global model is uh, updated by incorporating the aggregated parameter from the local updates. Um, and this can ensure the global model can benefit from the knowledge and improvements learned by each individual modules. And uh, so what we are doing this step is uh, similar to the global workspace. The global model will be broadcast since it contains the information from all the individual localized learning knowledge, uh, it will be broadcast to update uh, all these local uh, modules at the end of the learning. So now we basically put all these components together and uh, we want to testify if based on this architecture, can we uh, learn the most important uh, information from different observations to tackle a new given task. And the data set we are trying to use uh, is uh, a collection of different observations for the same classification task. For example, when we try to solve this task, we want to transfer the knowledge from the other observations. Um, and uh, we try to show its uh, performance in both the vision and the language task. So this graph shows uh, how many information is, uh, is lost during the knowledge transfer process. Um, so if we consider we have two different observations and the neural network just uh, learn individually on two different observations. Um, so we can imagine the information loss is uh, very large since they uh, learn different features independently. But uh, when we try to use the shared workspace, um, doing the learning while aligning their learned features, which show uh, in this pu purple line, we can see the information loss uh, is uh, better, uh, is reduced uh, largely uh, due to the knowledge alignment in the shared workspace. And I show here the improved performance and better aligned representation uh, while applying the shared workspace. So another problem is uh, ideally, if we know a component's uh, functionality, we can adaptively uh, choose some of the module to solve some task, but usually we don't know what kind of uh, skills we have in our knowledge base. 
And so what we can do is just uh, try solve these modules and figure out a uh, uh, feasible route to connect all the information we have uh, to solve a certain task. And so the idea here is uh, we have some learnable policy pie. Based on the learnable policy pie, we can image uh, this agent, some artificial systems will choose a set of module, a set of uh, uh, a skill neural network for certain tasks and uh, just uh, apply the knowledge of this uh, module. Um, as such, we can get a new module and we can evaluate it based on some objective, uh, um, objectives. Um, and we use the reward to update the policy. So this is just for one step, but uh, we can see we can do multiple steps until a certain uh, purpose, a certain uh, result is achieved. So here I show uh, several steps. We start from the initial step and until the terminal state. The terminal state here is uh, say, when the global model, when the agent achieve a certain level of performance, all the maximum the searching step uh, are reached, we just drop the searching and we will compute the total reward during one search. And our goal is to try to maximize the, the total reward during the knowledge searching. Um, so I show here the, a graph that shows the with the progress of the training. Um, we can see the total reward is also pro progressively increasing. That means the agents find a better and better uh, knowledge transfer policy to connect these different skills. So the second part I want to talk about is uh, how to uh, incorporating the idea of the modularization using different uh, um, independent uh, neural networks with the current uh, transformer architecture. So we can see in the transformer, it's based on the attention mechanism and in the attention mechanism, it's uh, used a very dense pairwise interaction. It basically means if I have three points, uh, pairwise points will have a connection with each other to uh, have a certain weight. Um, but if you com compare it with the global workspace theory, we can immediately know there is a communication bottleneck, uh, which will limit the number of interaction among these different modules. So in this research, we are trying to do is to simulate the global workspace uh, by dividing it into three steps. Uh, first, similar to the transformer, we have a set of samples, uh, which are presented at uh, uh, several squares here. And um, we have the second step, which is uh, to compute the bottleneck attention and uh, select the modules. And finally, the information stored in the global workspace will be sent back to update these individual modules. So a bottleneck attention is based on the method called the uh, head attention. Uh, it's basically to say we have an um, instruction, uh, we call it a query. And based on the current uh, instruction, what information we need to extract from the current uh, available observations. And the such observation will be used to uh, update the current memory. And another step is that we want to do a reverse uh, information flow, which is uh, we want to use the information stored in the memory to update the current observation, uh, which is the information broadcast from the global workspace. The benefit of it uh, is we can use our information stored in our memory to, um, to select some 
important information from the current observation and use that as the output to make some decision. Uh, so shown here is the blended bottleneck attention maps uh, when we trained it in uh, image classification data set. And on the left is uh, shows the attention map from four different memory slots. And as we can see for different images, each slot to learn a specific areas of the images to attend to. So it shows the different functionality of these the different memory slots. Um, similarly, when we extend the memory bank, the size of the memory, each memory has its own uh, functionality. And uh, here is another example, show the selected image patches by the bottleneck attention. We can see with the progress of the learning, um, we can get a uh, uh, a much more diverse uh, distribution of the uh, different information from the input. So the last part, I uh, do not have much time to describe it, but uh, we are trying to align the study from the whole field network. Uh, as we know, the whole field Network is the one method to build the associated memory to retrieve information from the uh, stored information in the memory. And we try to find out uh, several fixed uh, tractor points and align the information uh, with this fixed point. Um, right, so our initial result shows that uh, by using the global workspace, we can uh, improve the performance uh, uh, over the current vision transformer models and other methods uh, building upon the vision transformer. So that means uh, the emerging module specialization can help the uh, performance, uh, especially when we don't have enough data. So to conclude, first we uh, talked about uh, the selecting information for global broadcasting and the making it flexible, available is very important uh, to our human intelligence. And we try to build an architecture that resembles the state one functionality by introducing the global workspace in conventional machine learning models. And um, there are two ways the modules can be trended on independent tasks or jointly trended end to end and then try to tackle the generalization problems by improving the information transferability and also encouraging the computation. And then we show uh, the global workspace can be used in current artificial neural networks. Uh, also combined with other research about the memory to improve the model's performance about specialization and generalization. And we hope to see more uh, studies in this uh, uh, in this line of work. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we can have one quick question. Any question? Yeah. So if I remember correctly, in the original uh, presentation of the global workspace, uh, um, it was a lot about competition, but there is also a lot about the fact that uh, these modules are changing and not constant. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is the importance of what is called the environment or all other processes around. So how did you think about going in that direction, incorporating this kind of feature into your AI models? Yes, yes. Thank you for the correction. Um, so let me go back to this slide. Um, so we think the, in the global workspace, the different uh, modules can be built uh, based on two approaches. One uh, is based on the fixed uh, functionality. So these modules do not change uh, over the lifetime. But the other case is, uh, we consider a naturally emerging module specialization. So these modules are not fixed during the learning. So it will change uh, with, the, with the input. So for example, this image shows the one way started the training 
most information selected are quite similar with each other. But, but this information selected by these different modules, it can change with the progress of the learning. So it really depends on uh, what kind of data we put into the neural networks and uh, what task we want to solve. So based on these two factors, uh, the information selected and stored in the memory will also be different. And uh, also, as you mentioned, it will change uh, um, with the learning of the agents. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks, Yu Wei. Uh, so uh, let's move on to the next speaker. And so yeah. thank you. Put your slide. Our next speaker, yep. Andrew Monson. Uh, he is currently a chief of cognitive uh, behavior neurology at the VS Boston Health Care System and uh, also associate director of the Boston University Alzheimer Disease Research Center. So uh, I believe he will uh, share with some uh, research on a memory system uh, today. So let's welcome uh, Andrew. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for for having me. Uh, came in from from Boston to present to you today. Um, I, my co-authors are here, and this uh, research has been published in its entirety in the journal Cognitive Behavioral Neurology in uh, December. If you're interested in more of it, and I developed this theory while I was writing this book on memory. I'm trained as a memory uh, researcher. While I was reading at the same time uh, William James' Principles of Psychology, and I realized that you can actually answer a lot of the questions that were posed by uh, considering memory. So when we think about consciousness, you know, why did it develop? What does it do? What is it good for? And why is consciousness so difficult to control? In other words, why is mindfulness so hard? Are actions under your conscious control? And if actions are, then how come dieting and resisting other urges is so difficult? Can you drive or do other complicated activities without conscious awareness? Are animals conscious? Are there developmental, neurologic, or psychiatric disorders of consciousness? And why does consciousness feel like, in William James' words, a continuous stream when we know that the brain is actually processing massive amounts of information uh, in parallel? So does consciousness actually flow linearly with time? And the answer is it does not. Uh, we know from post-dictive effects that a later stimulus can affect the perception of an earlier stimulus. So William James gives the classic uh, example, when deeply absorbed, we do not hear the clock strike, but then our attention may awake after the striking has ceased and we can count off the strokes. The more common example that I think we've all experienced is you can be at a cocktail party, you can hear your name being said, and then you can retrieve the earlier part of the sentence uh, that your name was in. Experimentally, there's all sorts of post-dictive effects that have been uh, studied with a uh, fast presentation of stimuli, the color phi effect where we see motion and color change when there isn't any, and illusory rabbits that can be tactile, visual, or auditory. We also know that the brain is actually able to detect when uh, a stimulus is present versus when it's not, even though our conscious perception is not always able to do so. And then we have Libet's uh, controversial uh, experiment. I don't wanna go into it whether you believe it or not, but he argued that the conscious decision to move came after the brain's preparation to move. There's also interesting experiments that have been uh, replicated, originally done by Libet, where you could uh, stimulate either the finger uh, or the sensory somatosensory cortex directly and either way sensations were delayed by 500 milliseconds and referred backwards in time. We know that consciousness is too slow for music, sports, martial arts, other types of activities. We know that there are patients as was talked about this morning 
uh, with blind sight that have impaired conscious perception with intact action. This is also true with patients with visual perceptive agnosia who don't know how to put a card through a slot, but they can do it nonetheless. And this can also happen with healthy individuals using optical illusion, that perception is impaired, but action is intact. So how does consciousness contribute to evolutionary success? It often takes place after the perception, decision, and action. It's too slow. And from patients and healthy subjects, we know that judgments and actions can occur without conscious perception. Mindfulness is hard, so consciousness is difficult to control, which seems very odd if it evolved to allow us to perform intentional action. So what does consciousness do? How does it contribute to evolutionary success? And so what we argue is that consciousness developed as part of our episodic memory system. It developed to allow encoding and retrieval of episodic memories to take place. And we argue this is consistent with the work of Ledoux and Lau and their uh, colleagues. Consciousness binds the elements of a memory together. It provides a medium to replay memory traces. And we know uh, from the memory literature that episodic memory did not develop to uh, remember events verbatim. It developed to allow us to flexibly, creatively combine and rearrange memories of prior events to help us plan for the future. And we argue that this is equally true for all explicit memory systems and for consciousness. So when I talk about explicit memory systems, I mean episodic memory, which is memory for episodes of your life, like your dinner last night. It's part of, uh, it includes sensory memory, which is the ability to perceive things uh, that last uh, half a second to two seconds. It of course involves working memory, the ability to manipulate information online and hold it in memory. And it includes semantic memory, knowing who Cleopatra was or what temperature water boils at. And these are of course contrasted to implicit memory systems that are unconscious, including classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and procedural memory. So let's give an example as to how this is all working. So let's say you have sensory memory, you hear a dog barking. This sensory memory goes into working memory, which then allows you to retrieve an episodic memory of when that exact same dog was chasing you. Well, it's pretty easy to predict the future. Uh, that dog is likely to chase you again. Okay, but why is consciousness important for some sort of predictive activity for that? And for that matter, why is episodic memory important? Can't you just see the dog and let operant conditioning lead you to walk across the street? Well, we argue that consciousness is necessary to remember this event. Well, why is remembering the event with episodic memory so important? Well, sometimes the stimuli in the setting are similar enough for an operant conditioning to trigger the response, but sometimes they're not. Or sometimes they are, but the situation requires us to choose a different action. And we argue that it's only after consciousness developed as part of episodic memory that other conscious activities took place, such as problem solving. And this has to do with, for example, you have one memory of when you went to bushes by a cave and you were able to pick some delicious berries. And another time you went to that same cave and you were chased by a bear. So the problem solving comes in when you try to figure out, well, how can I make one uh, of these futures occur and not the other one? Well, so what? So how does saying consciousness evolved as part of the episodic memory system help us to understand consciousness? Well, if consciousness evolved as part of explicit memory, there's no reason that consciousness needs to operate in real time. There's no reason that it cannot function properly with a small delay. So we argue that we actually perceive the world as a memory. So conscious perception is remembering a sensation. 
But of course, we don't remember that sensation directly, right? The conscious perception is a mashup between the bottom-up sens sensory processes and the top-down episodic and semantic memory processes. And if you think about consciousness like this, then there's no problem with consciousness occurring after the perception, decision, and action. There's no problem with all those experimental postdictive effects. There's no problem with the brain being able to distinguish con uh, whether a stimulus is there, but our conscious perception being impaired. And there's no problem with sensations being delayed 500 milliseconds and referring them backwards in time. Right? That's what memory does. Memory refers things back in time. Now, what about decisions and actions? Well, we argue that your conscious decisions and conscious actions are actually memories of those unconscious decisions and actions. And if you buy this, then there's no problem with the motor cortex firing first and the conscious decision to move second. There's no problem with consciousness being too slow for sports and music and martial arts. Now, does that mean we never use our conscious mind to make decisions and guide actions? Of course not. And just like our last speaker was talking about, uh, I uh, like to pull from uh, Kahneman and Tversky's System 1, uh, System 2, although most of the time we use our System 1 system, sometimes we're using our System 2, the conscious memory uh, system. You can get a glass of water uh, using System 1, but sometimes to get a glass of water and you uh, have to figure out uh, if you're in some Hunger Games scenario, how you're going to get through these obstacles to finally get it, and then you're going to use uh, System Two. Okay, so why do we events think? Why do we experience events serially? Because that is how our memory system works. Why does it sometimes feel like we're one step removed? Uh, using whatever uh, metaphor you like, because it evolved this way to allow us to move scenes around in different ways, like we're a movie director moving scenes around on a storyboard. I have an analogy that helps to wrap your head around um, decisions and actions. I think about a horse as our system one on conscious brain processes, and the rider as our system two conscious mind. The horse is in control of moment-to-moment -moment decisions. The human rider is mainly going on uh, for a ride, but the rider can still provide either momentary or general instructions, and the horse is usually happy to oblige. So you don't need to tell a horse how to walk across a rocky field, but if that horse is gonna go from Kansas City to San Francisco, it's gonna need the rider. How can the rider do it? Well, they use sensory memory, episodic memory, semantic memory, and working memory to creatively, flexibly imagine different possible outcomes. Uh, just one more thing, the images actually come from the horse, and that's why mindfulness is hard. Now, the neuroanatomy, we argue, and I know I may differ from some of you in this room, that the neuroanatomy of consciousness is the neuroanatomy of explicit memory. So this includes the common structures that you would think, but we believe uh, Murray and colleagues that argue that every cortical area contributes to memory each in a specialized way, and we would add each contributes to a domain of conscious awareness. So visual areas, auditory cortex, parietal cortex, uh, et cetera. And we also argue that each region of cortex is autonomously conscious and is not depending on, dependent on any other cortical region. And I argue this because, and we can debate this later, there's no single cortical region, in my opinion, unilateral or bilateral, that renders the individual unconscious. I do think there has to be a hub, but I think subcortical structures like the intralaminar nuclei of the thalamus are likely the hub. All mammals have a hippocampus and a cortex, and thus they have the neuroanatomy for consciousness. Uh, that doesn't mean other animals are unconscious. It just says our theory doesn't say anything about them. I argue that there's all sorts of disorders of consciousness, including epilepsy, 
migraines and migraine auras, strokes and other cortical lesions, Alzheimer's and other cortical dementias. I think that patients who are delirious are awake but unconscious. Dissociative disorder and schizophrenia, I think, are uh, examples. Severe classic canner autism, I think, is an example. Uh, and in fact, in day-to-day -day life, a lot of our actions are unconscious. Not only can our morning routine be unconscious, but even when we consider a decision, we may end up coming up with the wrong answer about why we made that decision. We know this from the work of Michael Gazaniga and colleagues with split brain patients, but we also know this from the work of Nisbet and Wilson, who show that individuals are often unaware that a stimulus influenced their response, they're unaware of the existence of the response, or they're unaware that the stimulus affected uh, the response. I think that this theory helps to explain uh, why it is that people have difficulty controlling their behavior, why it is that sometimes it seems like you're watching self, yourself do something you don't want to do. Um, of course, this gets at the question of like, well, who are you? And of course, I believe the obvious thing, which is we are both our conscious mind and our unconscious brain uh, uh, processes. And as long as decisions are being made slowly, then conscious system two decisions can win out over unconscious system one decisions. Sometimes the conscious mind needs to convince the unconscious brain and sometimes use strategies, you know, like diets in order to be able to do this. And we can work on controlling our conscious thoughts by practicing mindfulness, but we can also work to unlock the power of our unconscious brain. Thanks very much. I guess we have time for one question, right? Thanks very much for your presentation. And the question I want to ask, um, my consciousness, uh, it, it seems to me that um, you're talking about the perceptual consciousness, not the phenomenal consciousness. If it is both, and then my question would be, do you really think um, the actual neuroscience or computational modeling that we can actually uh, understand or explain uh, the phenomenon of consciousness oh, a, a, absolutely I mean I, I this it, it's all absolutely I mean in the same way we're able to explain memory I think we can explain consciousness definitely happy to talk more after the after the session yeah okay and so no one our memory system has the important functions that can manipulate the older Take working memory, for example, it seems that uh, our attention will guide what is the, uh, the, the priority, the target that we have to keep in our working memory system. And take episodic memory system, for example, uh, when we sleep, we replay the episodic memory in a totally opposite direction, right? But it seems that we were not confused about the order of the real world, the things happening. Um, if the explicit memory has a strong relation to the consciousness, then how did our conscious experience will not be reorganized in a strange order? Well, um, it, 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 right. I mean, postictive effects show that our conscious experience is sometimes uh, out of order or it's manipulated by that. Uh, order, right? Yeah. So, so things can get out of order. Okay, our next speaker uh, is Sao Qi Chou. Uh, so, uh, Sao Qi is a master student uh, in a National Yangming Jiao Tong University for the moment, and uh, Sao Qi is a, a student of Ying Tong. Uh, so, I think uh, they're presentation will have some connection to each other. Okay, so, okay, that's welcome, Sao Qi. Okay. 
So hello everyone, I am Chiu Shaoqi and I'm going to talk about uh, boundary, uh, boundary extension effect in observer perspective memory. So let's begin. And in the past, we know that there are many things that could modify our memories. So for example, when we have misinformation, cognitive biases, or even when we have different emotional ar arousal, and we recall the same memory scene, we will recall it differently. Then what about perspective? When we change our perspective, would that modify our memories? And in this experiment, we show that when we change the perspective in memories, the boundary of the pictures in our memories change. The talk will contain three parts. The, uh, the first part, uh, I will interest you two concepts, which are observer perspective memory, OPN, and boundary extension, BE. And second, I'm going to talk about the experimental design. And there are three experiments, one main experiment and two follow-up ones. And three, I will talk about the conclusion. So the first concept that I want to talk about is boundary extension. This is a phenomenon where people usually remember more than what the original pictures have. So for example, if I show participant picture A and ask him to remember it, after that, I asked participant to draw it. He would draw something like picture C. So you could see the uh, boundary of the pictures has extended. And even if we give participant picture B, which the boundary of the picture has already extended more, like picture C, he would draw something like picture D, and the boundary extended even more. And there is another experimental design. So if I give participant the upper pictures, and then uh, I show him uh, the upper one and the lower one together and ask, which does he remember? He will say the lower one. So you can see that the boundary, it, the boundary of the picture in his memory is tended and it contains more backgrounds in his memory and he remembers something that is not visible in the original pictures. So human has this tendency to remember more than what is visually presented. The second concept that I want to talk about is observer perspective memory, and Intong has already said something about this. So there are two ways of remembering. One is use first-person perspective, and second, are you, or using third-person perspective. And first-person first perspective is not surprising. You just see an episodic memory in a way that you perceive this world in a, uh, a first-person way. But third person perspective is different. You use another few points to see yourself in that memory scene. So for example, if I ate dinner, if I ate dinner yesterday and I remember what I ate, I, I use a first third person perspective. I would see myself eating a dinner in that memory. And there are some terminology. When I say OPN, it refers to observer perspective memory, which is third person perspective. And if I say OFEN, it refers to field perspective, which equals to first person perspective. Let's talk about the first experiment. So the goal for the experiment is to test whether there's any difference between OPN and FEN in the boundary extension size. And the procedure is very simple. So I have 20 trials and each trial use one picture. So there are 20 different pictures in total. Each participant will see 20 pictures in a row and then they have to memorize it. And the, when the picture is gone, I will, show, and I will show the same pictures again, but with different ratio. And they have to adjust the picture size based on their memory. So they have to choose the one, okay, that is what I remember and then submit. The way to adjust the picture size is like this. So originally they see the 100% size, which is in the middle. And after the picture is gone, I will show the same features again, but with different ratio. They will have to zoom in or zoom out to the point where they think, okay, this is the one in my memory. If there is boundary extension that most people should zoom out the picture because the boundary has extended than the 100% size and it contains more background. Here's the diagram for experiment one. So the blue area represents the picture stimulus for five seconds, and there are 20 different pictures. So 
Lebo had to memorize 20 different pictures. And after the instruction words, Lebo had to adjust the picture size. This is a between subject design. So participants either use OPN or use FEN to record the pictures. So if I am in OPN groups, after I perceive 20 different pictures, and I have to use OPM, observer perspective memory, to recall what I have seen in, in, in those 20 features. So I will see myself seeing that 20 features and then use that memory to adjust the feature size. And the sense goes for FEN, but you use FEN, of course. And here's the data for experiment once. The result is significant, and there are two groups. So one is FPN, the other is OPN. And you can see that FPN has greater boundary extension size while OPN drop. So the message here is that the boundary extension is weaker in OPN. After we got this result, well, we'll have to explain why this is the case. So uh, we come up with two possible explanations. Uh, explanation one, E1, is that OPN is probably more chronically demanding than FPN. And explanation to E2 is that OPN might have further mental frame distance. So for uh, let's talk about E1 first. So some people may argue that, well, uh, OPN is more chronically demanding than FPN because you have to change your perspective in memories. So uh, you will have to spend some cognitive resource on, uh, on forming the OPN. Thus, you will not have enough OP, uh, cognitive resource for boundary extension to uh, emerge. So the boundary extension size is weaker. And the E2 is relatively straightforward. So few, uh, the viewpoint of FPN is closer because it's just right in front of the computer. Well, OPN requires participants to use a viewpoint behind their back. So it's supposed, it's supposed to have longer mental frame distance. So an illustration is like this. And my experiment two and three are basically in testing E1 and E2. So that's the second experiment. The goal is to test whether the cognitive demands would influence BE. And the procedure is basically the same as the first experiment, but I add the cognitive demanding test this time. And everything, everything else are the same. So 20 trials, 20 different features, and I use the same 20 different features as I have used in the first experiment. Each participant, each participant will see 20 features in a row. They have to memorize it and then adjust the feature size. But this time I ask participants to memorize fine numbers when they are adjusting the feature size. So I increase the cognitive demands here. And by this procedure, I can compare the FPN without CDT and FPN with CDT. So I can directly to tell whether the cognitive demands influence the boundary extension size. Okay, so because the experiment two has almost the same uh, procedure is experiment one. So let's refresh the diagram for experiment one. So blue represents the uh, feature stimulus for five seconds. They have to memorize 20 different features. And then after the instruction words, they will have to adjust the feature size. And diagram, uh, and diagram for experiment two is basically the same, but this time I add cognitive demanding tests, which are about memorizing fine numbers. And then I slide this into the adjustment phase. So they will have to adjust the feature size while memorizing fine numbers. And the detail for the orange part is um, they have to memorize one number and then adjusting for feature, uh, for feature size. So if I repeat this five times, then it got 20 different, uh, 20 different features in total. So they have to remembering something while memorizing something. The data for experiment two is also significant. And, and you can see that if participant using FEN only, that the boundary extension size is greater. And if participant do cognitive demanding tests, well, the boundary extension size drop. So we can, we can say that, okay, participant were indeed detract from the cognitive demanding test 
and they show less degree of boundary extensions. So the message is clear. So the higher Coney demands, the weaker boundary extension effects. The, uh, okay, so this is the third experiment. So the goal is to test whether the viewpoint will influence BE. And the procedure is also the same. Participant will have to sit two, but uh, the same as the first experiment, but they have to sit 2.7 meters away and everything else are the same. So uh, 20 different features, 20 trials, the same 20 features, and they have to adjust the feature size after they see the features. And I can compare the FEM with short viewing distance with uh, longer viewing distance. So um, let's talk about the diagram. So uh, basically, this, this is the diagram, basically the same as the first experiment. The blue area represent feature stimulus for five seconds, and then they have to adjust the feature size. But this time, when they were viewing 20 different features, they have to sit 2.7 meters away. So I increased the viewing distance. And this is the result. The result is also significant. And D1 is the short viewing distance, and it has long, uh, greater boundary extension size. And D2 is 2.7 meters away, so the longer frame distance. But the boundary extension size also drop. So the message here is that the longer frame distance, the weaker boundary extension effect. And from this, we can have our conclusions. Uh, from the conclusion one, C1, which is from experiment one, OPN has weaker boundary extension size. And C2 from experiment two, the higher quantity demands, the weaker boundary extension size. And C3 from experiment three, when the viewing distance is longer, the weaker boundary extension effects. So if, if we visualize this, the left one is the original stimulus that participant would perceive. And the left one, uh, the right one, the FEN and OPN, they also zoom out the picture. So they exhibit the boundary extension size and you could see the boundary has extended. But at the end, they zoom out a little bit more. So the BE size is greater, while OPN, they do not zoom out that much. So the BE size is weaker. And not only OPN, also when under higher coin demands or the longer frame distance, they also show less degree of boundary extension size. So the discussion one, uh, from C1, we know that OPN results weaker BE. And from C2, we know that the higher coin demands result weaker BE. So it is possible that OPN cause less BE because it's more conic demand. And from this a discussion too, from C1, we know that OPN results weaker BE, and we know C3 that the longer frame distance results weaker BE. But we also know that the longer frame distance actually make your representation size of the image smaller. So in your memory, the picture size should be smaller, right? If the longer, if your viewing distance is longer, then we can we can say that okay, it's possible that OPN has a weaker BE because the representation size is smaller. And discussion three is uh, we if we combine discussion one and two, we got discussion three. So we can say that um, we hypothesize that OPN and FPN are different in terms of Koenig demands and the size of the representation in memories. And we might directly to test this in the future, but that, at least that is what we get now. So that is the final conclusion. And that's it, that's everything for today. So thank you everyone for listening. Thanks so much for a, a really nice, uh, well-designed set of experiments. Um, <laughs> What I wonder, when I look at the uh, different uh, images that you show, and when I think about, you know, my last uh, uh, couple of days going around Taipei and making photographs of things, I realized there's sort of a, an optimal size that I try to get subjects in the frame and have a certain border around it. And I was wondering whether it's actually boundary extension versus, you know, having a sort of an optimal sort of size of the subject in the frame. Has anyone done it the other way around? 
like for example, like a, a turtle that's you can definitely see it's a turtle, but it's like very, very far uh, distant. And you know, I would think if people were asked to draw the picture of that turtle, they would make it larger and actually reduce the boundaries. Have people tried it the other way? Uh, uh yes. Um, so. Boundary extension effect actually disappear if it's a super wide angle. So, but I'm not sure whether it's more zooming or it's the same. So, so no, no one has looked to see if people end up zooming in? Uh, there is some picture has boundary constructions. So uh, when especially it's a scene oriented picture. So if you take a photograph of uh, a building, for example, rather than a person, then sometimes it will have boundary constructions, but it's like 50-50%, not always. Yeah, um, so it just might be worth, when you're thinking about your hypotheses in the next experiment, yeah. you, know, you might think about that alternative hypothesis as to why you get the effect at all. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. No, uh, I actually wanted to make the same point or a similar point, but to me, an aesthetic explanation works better than the explanations you put forward. Indeed, I don't think your conclusions follow from the results of your experiments, but that's a separate issue. But I think the aesthetic point is a really important one. And the, what you mentioned about the buildings is, I think, supports that in the some photos of buildings will be aesthetically correct mm. and others won't. So there's a less rigid uh, framing uh, expectations than there would be with people, for example. Um, so I think yeah, aesthetics seems to be a more powerful explanation here. And perhaps one aesthetics are being ignored too much. In yeah, but uh, I would say it is a very strong phenomena that a lot of psychologists have done this experiment, the boundary extension uh, experiment. And they, in the past, they found that most people really just zoom out the pictures, regardless the aesthetics experience or not. So uh, it's like, it's like um, sometimes we know that there is a, a ratio that fits that picture the most. Like um, we want to make uh, the people to be the center, and also there is left some edges to make the people look better or whatever. And um, this actually doesn't really affect the boundary extension effect in the past. At least that's what psychology finds. So. I don't. I really don't have a good explanation. I, I just have that result to tell you. Yeah. Yeah, probably. No, I don't mean like. I don't mean like badly. They're bad photographs. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Anyone would change these photographs, to make them better. Hmm. So maybe your memory does this naturally. Okay. Yeah. Is yeah probably the same. Uh, thanks for the talk. Quick procedural question. Uh, when you manipulated the uh, uh, task difficulty in experiment two, why did you add the cognitive task in the test phase, uh, the break section, rather than the encoding phase? Because the OPM FPM manipulation happens in encoding, right? Uh, because uh, the the hypothesis is that OPM is more cognitive demanding than FPM. So when you are recalling the same memory thing, you could recall it either in OPN or in FPN. But OPN is probably more cognitive demanding because you have to switch your perspective. So I add the cognitive demands here. In, so I only compare the FPN with CDT and FPN without CDT. OK, and I add the cognitive demanding test when they were using FPN to recall. 
So if I add the Kony demand layer, let you result the same as using OPN. So you can basically think I'm actually doing OPN here, but OPN is equal to uh, Kony demands plus at the end. So if I do the same at the end, but with some Kony demanding test here, it should have similar result as OPN. That's the idea. Do you think the nature of the cognitive demand that is associated with this memory task is comparable to that of OPN versus FPN? Uh, so I'm not quite sure I get your question. I'm sorry. A, a memory task, yeah. um, like this memorizing of five numbers, is, is it, do you feel that it's comparable to having to adopt a different perspective? Like does it, is it the same oh. kind of demand? Um, I don't have a really good answer for you here, but uh, for all I can say is that there are many ways to uh, manipulate the Kony demands and this is probably the easiest way to do. So that's why I use this. But whether it's comparable or not, I really don't have a good answer for you. Okay, thanks, Salchi.